Good afternoon and most welcome to 1412 of the series. We will continue with a nice little booklet of Melo-Ponty, The World of Perception. And we already came into lecture five, man seen from the outside. And I would say directly it gives me association with Thomas Nagel. The view from nowhere. The origo and subject in front of space, in front of object in space. Where the subject is this disembodied phantasm like thing, and the only real thing is the object. Space being merely a container. Without any significance effect not participating in the causal chain Page 81, thus far we have tried to look at space and the things which inhabit it, both animate and inanimate, through the eyes of perception and to forget what we find entirely natural about them simply because they have been familiar to us for too long. We have endeavoured to consider them as they are experienced naively. must now try to do the same with respect to human beings themselves. Over the last 30 or more centuries, many things have undoubtedly been said about human beings.
yet these were yet these were often the products of reflection What I mean by this is that Descartes, when he wanted to know what man is, set about subjecting the ideas which occur to him to critical examination. One example would be the idea of mind and body. He purified these ideas. He rid them of all trace of obscurity and confusion. Whereas most people understand spirit to be something like very subtle matter, O oh, smoke or breath. Descartes showed admirably that spirit is something altogether different. He demonstrated that its nature is quite other. For smoke and breath are in their way things, even if very subtle ones. Whereas spirit is not a thing at all, does not occupy space, is not spread over a certain extension as all things are.
but on the contrary is entirely compact and indivisible a being the essence of which is none other than to commune with collect and know itself This gave rise to the concepts of pure spirit and pure matter or things. Yet it is clear that I can only find and so to speak touch this absolutely pure spirit in myself. Other human beings are never pure spirit for me. I only know them through their glances, their gestures, their speech. In other words, through their bodies. Of course, another human being is certainly more than simply a body to me. Rather, this other is a body animated by all manner of intentions, the origin of numerous actions and words. These I remember, and they go to make up my sketch of that moral character. Yet I cannot detach someone from their silhouette, the tone of their voice and its accent. If I
if I see them for even a moment, I can reconnect with them instantaneously and far more thoroughly than if I were to go through a list of everything I know about them from experience or hearsay. Another person for us is a spirit which haunts a body and we seem to see a whole host of possibilities contained within this body when it appears before us. The body is the very presence of these possibilities. So the process of looking at human beings from the outside that is at other people leads us to reassess a number of distinctions which once seem to hold good such as that between mind and body. Let us see what becomes of this distinction by examining a particular case. Imagine that I am in the presence of someone who, for one reason or another, is extremely annoyed with me. My interlocutor gets angry and I notice that he is expressing his anger by speaking aggressively, by gesticulating and shouting.
not where is this anger? People would say that it is in the mind of my interlocutor. What this means is not entirely clear. For I could not imagine the malice and cruelty which I discern in my opponent's looks separated from his gestures, speech and body. None of this takes place in some otherworldly realm. In some shrine located beyond the body of the angry man. man. It really is here, in this room and in this part of the room, that the anger breaks forth. It is in the space between him and me that it unfolds. I would accept that the sense in which the place of my opponent's anger is on his face is not the same as that in which, in a moment, tears may come streaming from his eyes or a grimace may harden on his mouth. Yet anger inhabits him and it blossoms on the surface of his pale or purple cheeks. His bloodshot eyes and wheezing voice.
And if for one moment I step out of my own viewpoint as an external observer of his anger and try to remember what it is like for me when I'm angry. I am forced to admit that it is no different. When I reflect on my own anger, I do not come across any element that might be separated or, so to speak, unstuck from my own body. When I recall being angry at Paul, it does not strike me that this anger was in my mind or among my thoughts, but rather that it lay entirely between me, who was doing the shouting, and that odious Paul who just sat there calmly and listened with an ironic air. My anger is nothing less than an attempt to destroy Paul, one which will remain verbal if I am a pacifist and even courteous if I am polite. The location of my anger, however, is in the space we both share. In which we exchange arguments instead of blows and not in me. It is only afterwards, when I reflect on what anger is and remark that it involves a certain negative evaluation of another person, that I come to the following conclusion. Anger is, after all, a thought. To be angry is to think that the other person is odious. And this thought, like all others, cannot
as Descartes has shown, reside in any piece of matter and therefore must belong to the mind. I may very well think in such terms, but as soon as I turn back to the real experience of anger, which was the spur to my reflections, I am forced to acknowledge that this anger does not lie beyond my body, directing it from without, but rather that in some inexplicable sense it is bound up with my body. There is something of everything in Descartes, as in the work of all great philosophers. And so it is that he who draws an absolute distinction between mind and body also manages to say that the soul is not simply like the pilot of a ship. The commander-in-chief of the body but rather that it is very closely united to the body. So much that it suffers with it, as is clear to me when I say that I have toothache. Yet this union of body and mind can barely be spoken of. According to Descartes, it can only be experienced in everyday life. as far as Descartes is concerned. Whatever the facts of the matter may be, and even if we live what he himself calls a true melange of mind and body, This does not take away my right to distinguish absolutely between parts that are united in my experience.
I can still posit my rights an absolute distinction between mind and body which is denied by the fact of their union. I can still define man without reference to the immediate structure of his being and as he appears to himself in reflections. <laughs> which is somehow strangely joined to a bodily apparatus without either the mechanisms, mechanics of the body or the transparency of thought being compromised by their being mixed together in this way. It could be said that even Descartes' most faithful disciples have always asked themselves exactly how it is that our reflection, which concerns the human being as given, can free itself from the conditions to which it appears to have been subject at the outset. This definitely flies in the face of the non-dual movement where that doesn't, to my knowledge, seem to be an understanding that body and mind can be absolutely disjoint, disjunct, separated the mind free flowing with no bodily connection whatsoever. But at the very same time, they are one and the same, identical. I think this neatly and nicely parallels complementarity in quantum mechanics. Whether wave and the particle are the two most different aspects of reality that the universe knows.
when a wave is measured, the particle and all its properties, existences, directions, masses, disappear from you. The opposite clearly holds. A particle takes away all of the wave. It is just one needle-like point. It has all the properties that the wave doesn't. They are the truest contradictions that exist. But still, in the two slot experiment, you can clearly see the particles, the photons, passing through the slits and one by one making up the wave. You can clearly see that they are the same. You can see the wave building up one photon after one photon in a massive bead of coming into existence. There is also a very good reason why Melo-Ponty brings up this thing. I think most people who comes to the conclusion that there is no soul has thought about these things very, very deeply and in the manner which is absolutely normal and that is in terms of exclusion. I know for a fact and you will experience that my body is being anger, angry. It is angered. My face is red. My voice is shrill. My eyes, my pupils dilated. Palms sweating shoulders tensing, pulse going up. You can see that my body is being angered, but still there is something. Melo Ponty has a unique Sorry for the point, the pun. He's very pointy here. And the point he makes is one of the rarest points I heard, but absolutely magnificent. It is that they are absolutely contrary, but absolutely the same. We have touched on this subject before many times and I'd say this might be the most important subject if you want to understand your own soul or psyche. And it is also, I find forgiveness here for the understanding of Daniel Dennett and 
Hilary Putnam and John Searle, because the conclusion of identity between body and mind is also true, undeniably so. And since our normal way of reasoning never ever allows two contradicting things to be simultaneously true, no discourse, no books or very, very few books allow that to be the case. Quantum mechanics and Melo Ponty are most definitely exceptions. And I would have to bring into that nice group, the inspirer of Melo Ponty, Martin Heidegger, and Ludwig Wittgenstein. In different ways they have come to look at this incredibly hard subject. It's a defies normal understanding, but still it's most definitely there and it's causing people to not believe in the mental or rather reducing it to the material as in the case of Daniel Dennett, Richard Dawkins and or emergence as in the case of Chalmers and Coppel's Churchland which I would say it's a variety of not being able to uh, take in the contradiction. I couldn't either for ages it is difficult, it is seriously difficult and I myself as an orator today I believe this enormously difficult subject needs to be approached in different manners one approach is not enough. It needs to be embodied. My turning point was Lake of Johnson. Philosophy in the flesh and metaphors we live by. That was my first indication that something wondrous was going on. I would say that was a very important step in my thinking process to add to quantum mechanics. Uh, could we ask for a comment here on my dear colleague Kelly Lundahl maybe? Be so kind. I will attach the microphone, see if I can steady my hand. I've been painting all day, so my hands are a bit stiff. Hello, Molu Pontu. Is he's so right when he says that anger is in the whole body? For instance, when I don't get a good cappuccino, and if I get angry, it's not uh, my soul somewhere uh, which gets angry, but it's my stomach. No, this is the whole body, the whole being. <clears throat> Uh, more seriously speaking, um, hmm. I have been working on a paper about Jesus, the angry Jesus, uh, it's um, Mark chapter 1 verse 41, that is most manuscripts say that Jesus was compassionate when a leper came to him, but one manuscript called Pesai from 5th century says that he became angry, and um, scholars have discussed which is the right reading. And argued that in an edition, Greek New Testament edition, you should include both readings and separate them with a slash. So Jesus became angry, slash was compassionate. 
Um, hmm. So why do people have problems of uh, with seeing Jesus as angry? Perhaps is a Platonist idea that is. Uh, if you were a Platonist, where would you place anger in the ideal world? Uh, what would Plato say? I don't know. Uh, I don't think he, he, anger enters the ideal world. Uh, you are goodness there, I suppose. Uh, but anger, it's somewhere. Uh, so it's not only a dichotomy between body and soul, but it's also a dichotomy between, let's say, goodness and anger. And anger gets um, gets the bad position, which is, it has, of course. Uh, bad <laughs> anger is nothing good, uh, but but there can also be rightful anger, of course. I suppose, since Jesus was angry. And do you want to add something else? <clears throat> Yeah, very good point. Yeah, I think most definitely, and uh, you, you took me off guard there, but uh, I think there's been philosophers and psychologists been looking into uh, if you compare goodness with joy, happiness, benevolence, inside positive, that could be diminished if you don't allow yourself to have the contrary, the anger, as you said, rightful anger. They seem to be the same thing in some instances. A rightful anger and putting your foot down for, down for something that is good is also a joy goodness and uh, yes it's contradictory for Jesus and as you say he's perceived as platonically only good and that would make him a bit strange I would think not godlike anger Happiness, goodness could be like the wave and the particle. They are the same but completely different. This mystery in a riddle put into a black box. And so many people struggle with, I, I struggle with that for decades. I don't know what I thought in my youth. I don't think I ponder about it. I just assumed them to be completely different, but still same. But at some instant, I did began to ponder these ideas. And of course, the either or wasn't even something I was conscious about and I came to the conclusion that's only body I was left with a choice of only body or only soul and uh, for a long time it was only body in my case there is a very, very important question, and so many answer it in that way, I think. It's uh, very hard to get by, but may not point to your action that you put it down. Anger is definitely in the soul as well. There is things there, and it's often how anger starts with a thought. That audience pull. <laughs> or does it uh, start in the stomach? Yeah, yeah, it could start in the stomach. A feeling of something that is not correct and then the thought is coming all at the same time. 
I say thank you very much and a very pleasant afternoon. Thank Bye. you. Thank you. Thank you.